March 22nd, 2021, and it is 7 p.m. The school board meeting tonight is being conducted remotely via Google Meet. It is being live streamed by BEC TV and will be replayed for the usual BEC TV replay schedule. Please consider that while most of us in this meeting or viewing this meeting are not in the same room, all of us, wherever we are in Bloomington or the metro area, are on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary land of indigenous people. Bloomington Public Schools rests on Dakota land seated in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. Okay. Uh, we're gonna move into roll calls. So if you are present, please indicate that you are here. Director Bibi. Here. Director Bennett. Here. Director Olson. Here. Director Sorum. Here. Director Starks. Here. Corman is here. Director Steigab is not able to be with us tonight. So we got six board members present tonight. So next uh, we move into uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. We need our beloved flag. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, then we have approval of the agenda. And for the approval of the agenda, um, I would like um, to amend the agenda by removing items in part B, number four, items C and D. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Very good, thank you. So all those in favor of removing uh, those two items out of the agenda, please say aye. And um, you should have received an email a little earlier today. So just wanna make sure that you saw that. Um, Please say aye. Director Bibi? Aye. Director Bennett? Aye. Director Olson? Aye. Director Sorrell? Aye. Director Starks? Aye. And Corman, aye. That is six votes. And so um, those two items have been removed. And now we'd like to move approval of the agenda as amended. Um, so, so moved, Bibi? Thank you. Okay. Second. Thank you. So it was moved by Director Vivi and second by Director um, Bennett. All those in favor, please say aye. Um, Director Vivi. Aye. 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 Director Bennett. Aye. Director Olson. Aye. Director Sorum. Aye. Director Starks. Aye. In Corman, aye. That is six votes. Um, very good. So the agenda has been approved. Well, we go into recognition of students, staff, and public. So we're going to start with our um, student school board representatives who are here with us tonight. So please um, go ahead and start your reports, whoever wants to go next. And welcome to the meeting. Hey, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great Monday. Um, I can start off with my student report. So um, sports have been finishing up lately, especially this month. Um, one, I got a couple names here I wanna shout out. Shout out to Sam Gardner for finishing ninth at the state diving competition. We have wrestlers Victor Cabrera, Max Carlson and Zach Greenhouse um, that are moving on to the individual state preliminary round. Congrats to them. Um, um, Kennedy Swimming placed six place at the boys sections as well with almost everyone getting a new PR which is a new personal record so I want to give a big shout out to all the swimmers that just continue to grow and develop throughout the season um and our boys basketball team uh we won our first playoff section game um led by Amarion Hansbar but then ended up losing our next game unfortunately to South St. Paul 100 to 71 but big shout out as well to our boys basketball team um, another team as well as a boys hockey game, um, they lost their last game 7-2. to two. 
as that ended their season as well. But just a big shout out to everyone that competed in the winter sports this year. Big shout out. Um, also, one thing I want to mention is um, our student government and BSAC group collaborating to work on a welcome back encouragement project. So what each individual school did um, was send some students just to make posters and create a positive learning environment for everyone returning, especially with in-person school. We want to let this, especially mainly the teachers and staff just to feel welcomed, especially since they have such a hard job from switching from online to in-person at like such a rapid transition. Um, and with returning in school, it seems that everything has been, I've been there for like two days or so, but I've been a little ill, so I've been trying to quarantine myself. But as far as I've been in school, proper precautions have been being taken. Um, kids are that are in school are enjoying it, and there are kids that enjoy having the option. So I just want to give a big shout out to all the teachers and students that have just been muscling through everything during this tough time, and thank you. Thank you, Tristan. That's awesome. Um, can you guys hear me? Oh, okay, okay, cool. Um, so a lot has been happening at Jefferson since obviously we're back in person now. Um, just like Tristan said, our winter sports are also finishing up. So our girls hockey just finished their season and it was an emotional ending, um, but they did a really good job this season and won several games. Our boys and girls basketball did really well and um, like something really fun is that like our student section was able to watch their games, which is really awesome. Um, our show choir, both Connection and Drive, which is our uh, varsity and uh, JV show choirs, were able to film their beach-themed show choir set on Saturday, and I heard that that was a lot of fun for them. Um, and then uh, congratulations to John Clark, who placed eighth in the Nordic uh, state race. Uh, another congratulations to Bavia Shivaram, who advanced to the Humor Finals in the NSDA National Qualifiers, which is really awesome. Um, but overall, students are really excited to be back in school, um, and I hope that it can last. Even though I'm a distance learner myself, and the transition into Chi 3 has been pretty difficult because of like FOMO and not seeing my friends and stuff like that. Um, I'm glad to see that students are really having fun and enjoying themselves while staying safe for the most part in school. Um, and also, uh, the encouragement project at Jefferson was really amazing in collaboration with BSAC. Um, at Jefferson, we did posters welcoming like the freshmen and the teachers, but we also did um, cards for each one of our teachers um, just to like show us that we appreciate them so much because I know that it can be difficult for them as well. And um, we appreciate them so, 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 so much. Um, but overall, uh, for spring break, make sure to enjoy yourself, relax, um, be mindful and safe wherever you're going or even if you're staying at home so then we can return back to school afterwards. Thank you. Thank you both and uh, congratulations to our athletes. I'm glad to hear all those reports and all the, the successful times and the hard work of our students and um, I truly admire the resilience of you guys and all of our students and how brave you are and how determined and I'm glad that you, your uh, friends are happy to be back in school. I know it's pretty exciting and I also know that it's not easy. It's, it's a strange after so many months uh, of being away from school, it definitely takes a while to, um, to kind of get used to that again, to that sort of rhythm. So truly hope that you stay safe and uh, practice self-care. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, Okay, on the school board page of the district's website, there is a link for Bloomington residents, district staff, students, and parents to submit a comment to the school board. Submitted comments might be read during the recognition of the public portion of the meeting, providing that the comment is not related to topics on tonight's agenda and guidelines outlined on the comment form have been followed. We will allow up to 15 minutes to listen to public comment that has been submitted prior to the meeting. If the board receives comments that exceed the 15 minutes, those comments not read during the meeting will be shared with the school board. Should there be no comments or only a few that take less than the allotted 15 minutes, the meeting will proceed. A reminder that the school board listens to public comment and does not respond during the meeting. Typically, matters are referred to administration. So, Mr. Kaplan, do we have any public comments for tonight? 
Madam Chair, Superintendent Fujitaki, members of the board and the viewing audience, we do have five submissions this evening. Uh, the first one comes to us from Clint Robinson, and it reads, please do not have teachers talk to my children about this trial or express any other political views to them. This is not the responsibility, nor am I okay with adults expressing political opinions to my children without me present. Instead, please ensure that teachers are teaching the curriculum they are paid to teach and leave the politics, opinions, and moral lessons to the parents. Racial injustice and police brutality are not on trial here. A human is on trial for murdering another human. Whether Officer Chauvin is a racist, whether officer, whether other officers are racist, whether police forces overall are racist, or whether police use excessive force are all irrelevant to this case. This trial must be judged on the merits of this case and only this case. You cannot put a man on trial for the actions or opinions of others, let alone for the societal woes. And I certainly don't appreciate you sending emails expressing an opinion to the contrary. BLM and other political groups are not judge or jury. They do not get to decide guilt or innocence. If the verdict is guilty, but the sentence is light or the verdict is innocent, BLM will riot. When that happens, do you intend to email the parents and denounce them for rioting? Do you intend to use the response as an example of poor behavior that should not be tolerated by society? Do you intend to pass a resolution providing guidance to your staff that they are only to say, share opinions that denounce BLM for their actions? I think not. I believe you will condone BLM's poor behavior based on the merits of their stated motives and send more emails sugarcoating your support of their behavior by describing it as protesting. Then you'll shield your BLM support by conflating it with rhetoric about equal humanity and offer up support the research has shown will help my student. Because after all, what kind of racist animal would have the gall to challenge someone who is professing equal humanity and trying to help students? We've all seen this game before. Unfortunately, it's a tactic that politicians have used to claim the moral high ground for centuries and it's nonsense, utter nonsense. The second entry also comes to us from Clint Robinson. School counselors are there to support kids with any of their concerns. They have been there for decades. Every parent is aware of their existence. Perhaps instead of bond, um, bo bundling all of this information to one message as a way of trying to sneak your support of BLM past the goalie, you could have written two emails. One that discusses how you will all wasted countless hours taking a vote to approve a resolution that states you think all kids should be treated equally. Uh, good God, did, did it really take a resolution for you all to come to that conclusion? And a second email is a simple reminder that the counselors are there for our kids for anything, including to discuss current events as long as the parent consents to such conversations. As a side note, I'm guessing the guidance you gave your counselors was more of an order that they are not to share a political opinion that differs from your resolution. Yuck. Perhaps your next resolution should be one that censors the ISD 271 school board from publicly taking political positions. You are all entitled to those positions like the rest of us, but please don't use your power or 1,500 staff and access to Bloomington's children as a means to force your opinions onto the impressionable minds you have been entrusted to educate with knowledge. Resist the temptation if you can't. Please demonstrate that you understand and respect parenting boundaries and share your opinions with your own kids and leave ours out. My last plea, please let our kids be kids and get lost in their schoolwork, friendships, and extracurricular activities. They don't need politics. They are all extremely aware of the uh, expletive storm that exists outside of their school. And like the rest of us, they want to escape it and are completely exhausted and over discussing it. Best of luck to us all. The next submission comes to us from Tom Lloyd. And it simply states, how will the school board make sure to keep BIPOC during budget cuts? The next submission comes from Anna Benjamin and reads, I am a current student, I'm a current student in the Bloomington Public Schools. The school board needs to continue to implement more diverse curriculum and encourage anti-racist conversations in classrooms and throughout the school. The education of all students and teachers on issues of race needs to be a priority. The last submission comes to us from Kevin Hendricks and reads, in relation to the parental message and YouTube video contained in that on March 9, 2021, on the Chauvin trial. As a retired police commander for the Bloomington Police Department, I was disappointed in this poorly thought out communication. I'm not sure if you realize the amount of work and effort over many years by both entities to develop and maintain a good working relationship. 
not just at the administrative level, but at the operational level as well. As a longtime citizen in Bloomington and an unabashed supporter of BPS, I can tell you that this kind of poor judgment and disregard for necessary and good relationships will make me reconsider any continued support going forward. I am just astonished. With that, Madam Chair, it ends the comments for this evening. Thank you. Um, we're going to move into the part A of the agenda. Part A contains uh, board business, finance, et cetera. And I'd like to move approval of part A of that agenda. There are a second. Second. Thank you. All those in favor of approving part A of the agenda, please say aye. Director Beebe? Aye. Director Bennett? Aye. Director Olson? Aye. Director Sorum? Aye. Director Starks? Aye. And Foreman Aye. So this um, part A has been approved. And then we moved into the part B. And for this part B, we are gonna start with the American Indian Education Compliance. And I'd like to call Assistant Superintendent Dr. Jenna Mitchler and Heidi Hecker Program Coordinator. Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Corman. Can we read the resolution first? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, be resolved the School Board of Independent School District 271 accepts the resolution of non concurrence by the American Indian Parent Advisory Committee for the 2020 21 school year. There a second. Second, Maya Olson. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Great, thanks. Uh, so, Chair Corbin, Superintendent Fujitaki, members of the board, viewing community, we're here tonight to talk to you about the vote of concurrence or non concurrence from our American Indian Parent Advisory Committee. So, I just want to first remind everybody as we go into this presentation that we're following state statute 124D77, which you'll hear a little bit more about later on, but allows us to hear from, and it really is an opportunity to hear from our American Indian Parent Advisory about the work that we're doing in our district, particularly supporting our American Indian students. So, that's what we're going to be talking about here tonight with this presentation. So I'm here with you. Heidi Hecker is our American Indian Program Coordinator. Gina Aulis is our Parent Advisory Committee Chair. And then Anita Eckert is also here as a, a Parent Committee member. So I'll be sharing with you a little bit tonight. So for uh, this presentation, we're here to share with the board and the community that the American Indian Parent Advisory Committee has voted to submit a resolution of non-concurrence. And so um, for the next pieces of this presentation, I'm gonna hand things over to Gina Alvis to share a little bit more. Gina? Yes, thank you, Jenna. Um, like Jenna said, my name is Gina Alwes. I am the chair of the American Indian Parent Advisory Committee here in um, Bloomington. Um, I am a parent of two students in the district. So as she said that we, the American Indian Parent Advisory Committee have voted a resolution of non-concurrence um, on March 5th of this year for the 2020-21 school year. And so I'm gonna go to the next slide. And so APAC has presented the school board concerns um, about the lack of achievement and engagement of our native students for many years dating back to 2011. We are here today with the same concern as we have not seen adequate progress with our students. A significant number of our native students have struggled during distance learning and we have real concern on how this is going to further impact the achievement gap and the graduation rates. The American Indian Education Program has a staff of two people to work with more than 200 students spread across all 15 buildings within the district. And this, the staff of two is not nearly enough to support the, the unique needs of our students and to provide the teachers with uh, the guidance that they need and the necessary materials that they need for uh, culturally relevant materials. 
So here on this screen is some of our recommendations that we have identified. Uh, the first one is to identify students not meeting academic standards and those at risk for not graduating. Provide a recovery plan for the academic ground that has been lost this year. Ensure that APAC is provided the opportunity to contribute guidance and input for the achievement and integration plan so that funding can be allocated to help meet the unique needs of our Native students. and providing a year-round school option. And then our last one is providing personalized academic plans to increase engagement and build teacher-student connections. Thank you, Gina. So yep. where do we go from here? So first we'll um, begin collaborating with a variety of departments within the district to plan next steps with regard to each recommendation. The Minnesota Department of Education asks that the school board and district respond in writing within 60 days. That gives us a working deadline of May 22nd. And data collection and, pro and progress monitoring will be, be ongoing throughout the next school year. So uh, I also want to just mention that we, so when I say we, it's the pronoun I'm using for Heidi, myself, those we collaborate with. Um, we take the recommendations and the vote from the APAC very seriously. And um, we recognize it's been a really, inc uh, really incredibly challenging year. It really has. And we want the parent advisory to know that the concerns are heard um, and really above heard appreciated because we, as we've talked about at school board meetings in the past, uh, really value stakeholder feedback. It's at the center and the core of what we do, particularly as we're using a design thinking process to develop safe and supportive schools. So we really see this as a, an opportunity to hear from the APAC and to find ways that we can grow and engage in continuous improvement. So what comes next is really important as Heidi has mentioned. And what we plan to do is develop uh, an improvement plan that takes up these recommendations. We'll be using the same template as we use with our site improvement plans. So we'll include measurable goals. We'll have ways to measure progress. And importantly, we'll be working towards meeting the Bloomington mission statement, which is ensuring that every learner in our district has the ability to thrive in a rapidly changing world and then also connecting it to our vision about pathways to career and college, helping our students meet their pathways, milestones along their journey. So with that, thank you for um, listening into our presentation, hearing the APAC's uh, vote of non-concurrence and recommendations. Thank you. Questions, board members? Director Bennett. Yes, uh, first of all, Gina and, and Heidi, thank you for being here this evening and bringing this to us. Um, I have a question for, for Dr. Mitchler. Will there be an opportunity for the school board to have a conversation about some of these recommendations? Because I'd like to, I don't have the conversation, because some of these recommendations are things that I would like to see happen, or at least a discussion around them. So. Will there be that opportunity at some point in the near future? Yeah, Director Bennett, that's a good question. So um, what we have to do with our state statute is respond. The board will respond within 60 days to these recommendations. And during the next then probably 30, 40 days leading up to that next board or to that board meeting where we'll present, again, we'll uh, connect. I'll be working with the board chair. We'll be trying to work through what those recommendations then look like in terms of our next steps. And I wonder if Heidi, you have anything additional you want to add to that as well. Um, I guess I'd just like to add, this is a really good opportunity to have some more discussion and to kind of learn how to, um, how to meet these needs. Like Gina said in the, in the intro is um, some of these same concerns have been brought forth for a number of years and we've yet to really figure out a way to help attack that achievement gap and narrow it. And this year, 
the, we know of all the issues that happen in distance learning. It's probably going to just widen the gap. So I think this is a great opportunity to have some real discussion with our parents and with Jenna and the board and, and see what kind of solutions there can be. Because I'm pretty, pretty hopeful. I know the committee has some really great things to say uh, around curriculum, uh, a lot more uh, culturally relevant material has been uh, taught and is being developed and a lot more PD is done in that area. And that was one of the recommendations that the parents had before. So they were very happy to see that's done. Now we just need to develop more engagement and more, um, some real more focus on, on getting our kids back in academic shape. Director Beatty. Um, hearing the word engagement can mean many things to different cultural groups. What does engagement look like within the um, Native American community? Thanks for that question, Director Beebe. I wonder, um, I'll just open that up to anybody who's here helping present tonight. So Heidi, Gina, and then um, we also have, as I mentioned, another member of our parent advisory committee here with us tonight. Um, so if any of you would be willing to help, that would be wonderful. Thoughts? Yes, I can start. Um, one of the reoccurring themes that's been coming from the parents on the committee uh, with engagement is a connection between the student and the teacher. It seems especially with this year with distance learning, there's not a connection. There's not a understanding of who the students are that are in the class. Um, it just really seems like that part is um, lacking this year. But then also just uh, just having like a personal connection to with the teachers. That was part of our last recommendation that we had was we really wanted to increase that connection so that the student feels that there's somebody there that is interested in them and wants to make sure that they are there and that they're participating, they're able to um, feel there's somebody kind of there on their side when they're there at school. Anita, did you have any other thoughts on that question? Hi, sorry. Um, no, I think Gina hit it very well on that part. Um, you know, I think we just need to catch these kids before they really fall behind and take the opportunity to help them out before they get to the part where they, they can't recoup. I think I like to add one one aspect of that also that relationship or connection develops more trust. And I think that's a piece that is really important for our native kids and families and parents is developed with the teachers is that is trust. And I think through um, building relationships that kind of falls into place. Director Sorum. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, it indicated that there's only two people that are, are uh, working with this. So we haven't really identified or enlarged the group um, to provide liaisons or any of those types of things. Isn't this still under the umbrella of the of the DDAC? And um, so looking for curriculum enhancements and all of the teachers in all of the subject areas working with that, but especially in social studies and some of the other um, more um, based subject areas that we probably do need additional teachers, but the, the concurrence or non-concurrence doesn't really address adding staff or that, or do they? So, Director Sarm, I can take that question to start off. Um, so, uh, 
you're correct in saying that the Office of Educational Equity does not encompass our American Indian education programming. Uh, years ago, I think the two were together. Now they are not together, they're separate. And this is why I think one of those recommendations is so important is that we're finding ways for the American Indian program uh, staff for Heidi and Clarissa who work together to be in close collaboration with, um, with really lots of other people in our district, but working in close collaboration as well with the Office of Educational Equity. So that work, I know Heidi has begun doing some of that work with Dina and that work will continue um, and we'll, we'll look for ways we can continue to improve it as we move into next year too. Wonder Heidi, do you have anything else you wanna to add to that? That was actually a recommendation that parents had on last year's recommendation was to increase the American Indian Ed staff. Um, so we are not just a staff of two, that we would have a, a, a stronger staff to reach more students and, and classroom teachers. Thank you. Director Olson. Hey, I was thinking that while well, we are fortunate to have Juma Waganda here from the Student Advisory Council, uh, that maybe we could connect her with Heidi Hecker in some way to find out if there are any students um, who are, uh, you know, any of the American Indian students who are interested in joining the Student Advisory Council. Maybe that would help. I'd love to have a chat. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, any other board members have any questions? Any other questions? Juma and Tristan, do you have any questions or comments? No, I don't have any questions, but um, I think that that would be great. I would love to have um, more diversity in BSEC and um, expand this conversation just so that everyone is included as much as possible. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we were just talking with, um, Heidi at the beginning of the meeting about other opportunities as well for, for parents in, within our uh, board committees or committees of the board. <laughs> so um, yeah, definitely those connections and, and to be able to talk, that would be great. And um, this concurrence and non-concurrence ever since I joined the board <laughs> 10 years ago, we go between yes and then no, and then yes and then no again. And every time it's non-concurrence, it's like, oh, here we go again, you know? <laughs> it's, it's heartbreaking every time. It's like, but why, you know? Why do we go back to that same spot? And definitely this year has been so challenging, and especially for uh, our American Indian students and students of color. And so I can, I can see how, um, you know, this kind of fits within, unfortunately, with, within the kind of year that we had had, but definitely need to um, take the steps into the direction of what else are we going to do? What, what else do we need to do to, to help our students so that this doesn't happen again? Um, and um, Dr. Mitchler, you uh, brought up the, the safe and supportive schools. Uh, plan and how through that we might be able to um, address this issue, right? And the issue of the achievement gap. So that's why that seven supportive schools, once again, is so, so crucial in, in the work that we're doing um, during this time too. So anything else that you'd like to add? Chair Corman, I think Anita had one thing she wanted to add as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got your hand raised. Go ahead. Yes. Hi, Nellie. Thank you. I'm so glad that you mentioned that we go back and forth, back and forth, because that's what I mentioned in our meeting when we came to this non-concurrence. I've, I've been on the parent committee board for a long time, and I said, it's like we take one step forward, and then that achievement gap still doesn't close. And that's our main issue, is every time we recommend the achievement gap, it never closes. And I don't see any progress of getting those kids to where they need to be. And that's that's heartbreaking. It certainly is. Okay, uh, Director Olson. That's all I wanted to say too, is that um, it was very heartbreaking to read, read this um, letter. So I just wanted to tell you that. Uh, that I care very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
it is heartbreaking, but it, once again, it's another loud call of, hey, listen, something's not right and continues to be wrong. And so what else do we need to do? What other kind of approach do we need to take in this? Who else do we need to um, reach out to? You know, because this is not just Bloomington, but it's statewide, it's a constant issue. So where else do we go? And what else needs to happen? So definitely need to engage more um, ourselves, like Director Bennett said, into those type of conversations. So let's do that, um, Director Mitchell or Dr. Mitchell. Yeah, thanks, Chair Corman. So I just wanted to repeat one more time that we do, I think we see this as, um, sort of an opportunity. What we do next is really what's what's important here. And you know, Heidi and I have been talking a lot about how important it is for us to have measurable metrics in order to monitor our progress as we move forward. And so, for us to be able to have these recommendations, really sort of um, put them into a smart goal format, find a way to monitor is going to be is going to be key. And so, we look forward to seeing how things progress and develop over the next couple of months. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I like that word opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I think that we're ready to vote, right? So all those in favor of approving the American Indian Education Compliance uh, Documents Resolution and Non-Concurrence, please say aye. Mm -hmm. uh, director, and I'm sorry, Anita, I don't know if you had any other comments or questions. Just wanna make sure <laughs> before we vote. Okay, Director Bibi. Um, aye. Director Bennett. Aye. Director Olson. Aye. Director Sorum. Aye. Director Starks. Aye. And Corman. This one has been approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, okay, so next we have the computer science update. And for this one, we have Mr. John Weiser, Executive Director of Technology and Information Services. Good evening, Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujitaki, and board members. Uh, I'm here tonight with Annie Schrader. She's our computer science specialist for the district. Uh, Dr. Cassie Sharber and Lana Peterson from the University of Minnesota. And we're here to share with you the progress on the district's computer science program, which is in its second year. Uh, there's no board action needed this evening, but I'll give you a little bit of history before I turn it over to, to Annie and team. Uh, our computer science program comes directly from the district's vision to be an educational leader and to help students thrive. The program's made possible because of the technology referendum that voters passed in 2013. Among other things, that plan, remember we call it Next Technologies for Learning or NTL, allowed us to take the district one-to-one -one with student devices. It allowed us to shift to digital content in our classroom and it really compelled us to tackle the internet access gap, which we were started to wrestle with back then for our families. We didn't see it at the time, but uh, these steps prepared us well for this difficult year. Those things that we put in place really have, uh, have really done our students and our families a, a great service during COVID. So that was the foundation upon which we can build great programming. And on top of that foundation of NTL, the digital learning team has built a strong computer science program. And now I'll let Annie uh, and Cassie and Lana tell you more about it. Good evening, thank you for having us. So I just wanna share a little background about why computer science is so essential for Bloomington learners. And there are lots of reasons, but three really are um, kind of prevalent here in Bloomington. And the first one of those are the skills that students learn when they're learning computer science. And those aren't necessarily the programming or coding skills you think of right away. They're actually the skills that are kind of happening behind the scenes when students are learning computer science. And we uh, often refer to them as computational thinking skills. So these are things like pattern recognition, learning how to debug and persevere, um, learning how to design an algorithm, learning how to take a big problem and break it down into smaller pieces. Those are all those really important thinking skills that students uh, get when they learn computer science and then are transferable to whatever it is they choose uh, to do. 
Another reason is equity. We know that early access to computer science education can really help increase participation in computer science and in STEM. Uh, that's particularly important um, among uh, women and students of color who are underrepresented currently in the computer science workforce. The other reason is joy. So computer science, you're gonna see quite a few pictures during this presentation. And it really helps learners do two things. One is express themselves creatively and also helps them solve problems. And both of those things are a lot of fun to do for students across the board from kindergarten all the way up through high school. So there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of creating um, and kind of imagining uh, a future where they really hold the power to create solutions that they want. So that's a fun and exciting piece. I'm gonna dig just a little bit deeper into that um, center reason of equity and just provide a little bit more background around that piece. So right now there are major disparities in who has access to and engages in STEM. So people of color, people in rural areas, women, English language, English language learners, people with disabilities, and economically disadvantaged people are consistently underrepresented in STEM, and that includes computer science. So what we know works is K-12 computer science education. It can help improve those disparities. So the graphics that I put here are um, kind of to showcase that uh, that is not currently what's happening everywhere. We are really unique in our approach to this program. So currently this is national data, um, but schools that have more uh, students who are from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups have less access to computer science. Schools that have more students on free and reduced lunch have less access to computer science. So it's really critical when we talk about computer science for all, we really mean all when we say that. And then I also just have to really emphasize that providing access is just the first step. So providing access to all is step one, but it's also really important for all of our computer science programming that we ensure that all students feel successful, that they feel that joy that I was talking about, that they see themselves in the curriculum and that they feel like they belong within the classroom environment, but also just within the larger um, computer science and science and STEM um, fields. So that's really important. So we pay a lot of attention to not just making sure that all students have access, but also paying attention to that all students experience success. So what does it look like today? Um, it's been a pandemic for almost a year and we have shifted and our plans have changed and then they've changed again and again. And yet all year long, students have still had really wonderful experiences learning computer science. So I just wanted to share something that just happened last week. Um, really excited that the um, kindergartners at Indian Mountain spent a whole week really doing what we call unplugged learning, which is not connected to a computer. So they were learning about release their identity as computer scientists and learning that anyone can be a computer scientist. And on the last day, they got to meet a computer scientist via Google Meets. And so um, our computer science specialist at Indian Mounds, his name is Lee Nelson, he adds a computer science uh, bit to all of the news shows that computer, uh, the Indian Mounds students get. So each time they see the school news, they learn what other classes are doing in computer science. So I'm just gonna share a, about a minute long clip of that. Uh, one of the messages that is so important in our time in learning about computer science for every grade is that CS is for everyone. So let me share a clip of a recent lesson where I had the chance to introduce some kindergartners to Mrs. Adrienne Waltz. Uh, one of the ways Mrs. Waltz uses computer science is by using the power of computers to help people who are sick get better. So um, one of the things I do as a computer scientist is I get to help people. Um, and so if you can think of like your favorite superhero, I actually have had the opportunity to help save people's lives, which is really fantastic. And I really love being able to do that. 
Mrs. Waltz did an amazing job through our Google Meet time together explaining how computer science could be understood in terms a kindergartner would understand. So she compared things to color crayons and other things that we enjoy. And then oh we got gosh. a chance to do our computer, computer science chant for science her. Science is using the power of computers to solve our problems and express ourselves. <laughs> Yay! Well, thanks for letting me share those clips that help us remember that CS truly is for all. It's for everyone, no matter who you are or what you like to do, computer science is for you. And we can all use the power of computers to solve our problems and express ourselves. I love that you get to see a little bit of Lee Nelson in action. We have a wonderful uh, computer science team of phenomenal teachers. So it's great that you get to see a taste of that there as well. Um, one of the messages, messages that is, that is so, so important, important in our, in our time. time. Sorry about that. All right, so uh, you may have seen this slide before, but I just wanna be clear on vocabulary I'll use in the next portion of this presentation. We do talk about computer science in terms of two pathways here in Bloomington. So the first is an elementary and middle school program that we call computer science immersion. And that is a deeper immersive experience for students who are interested and passionate about CS. Um, and that specifically um, is at two elementaries and one middle school for now, um, but growing next year, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we talk about CS for all. So I can't have an equity slide saying how important it is that all students get computer science if we don't act on that. So we do have initiatives for all students in Bloomington. So we'll talk about both of those pieces um, right now. So computer science for all at elementary. So I'm just going to share where we're at right now and then where we're headed, um, particularly next year. So um, where we're at right now, we're a little bit behind schedule in terms of you know, CS for all at the elementary because of COVID, but we're going to catch up steam really quickly. So this year, we're really working with our tech integrationists, building up their understanding of computer science and how to teach it in a way that makes everyone um, feel successful. So uh, that word we've continued this year. And then in May, all elementary schools will be participating in a We Do CS Week. Um, so they'll have some exciting, fun computer science activities happening in May. How that will grow um, is that those tech integrationists will then take their learning and really start to work with teams of teachers to find places where computer science can be integrated into things that they're already doing. And we're gonna um, work towards a goal of at least two experiences for every student, regardless of their school and regardless of their grade level at the elementary level. Um, so two experiences of computer science led by both their classroom teacher and that tech integrationist who has the CS knowledge. We'll also um, look to really expand and kind of um, systematize after school and summer programming so that students who are really interested want to uh, have opportunities to learn more. At the middle school, we currently have one quarter of, uh, or all sixth or eighth graders take one quarter of computer science and technologies. And that exploratory is, is running. So we'll continue the development of that course. Again, work on after school and summer programming at the middle school level too. At the high school level, um, this year we have um, been writing some new courses that will uh, be launched next fall, uh, and that will continue. That work will continue next year. So when I look at um, high school specifically, um, this is kind of a long-term goal of what we're hoping to achieve. So pieces of this are already um, existing at both high schools. Pieces of this are kind of partway there, and then some of this is coming in the future, but really making sure that there's foundational options for all students, making sure that there's lots of explorations. So depending on what a student's passion is, there's something there for them. And then making sure there's some job-like experience that students can have, whether that's internships or um, an entrepreneurship project, that type of thing. So that's an in-progress kind of picture of what we hope to build at the high school level that uh, would be available for all students. So CS immersion, now talking about that pathway that's a little bit deeper, more immersive 
Um, so where we are right now, we're all in all grades at Indian Mounds and at Poplar Bridge. Where we're growing to is Bloomington Online School. So next year we will be fully implementing um, for grades K through five um, at Bloomington Online School. At the middle school, we have a program running right now at sixth grade and that will grow to seventh grade next year at Olson. And then um, we will begin that implementation sixth through eighth grade at Bloomington Online School. So that's our, our big growth for next year. So I've given you kind of the back uh, the backdrop to uh, now hear how all of that is going and how it's really working in practice. So everything we design, all the research that we use to make sure that we're implementing these programs well is all done in partnership with the University of Minnesota um, and with Cassie and Lana who are here to share with you now. So I'm really excited um, to pass it over to them. Good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of Dr. Sharber, myself, uh, and our other teammate, Sarah Burksdale, who did a lot of work on this, we just want to say it's been an honor uh, to partner with Bloomington Public Schools on this project. Um, we are research practice partners, so what we do is we partner around problems of practice and help uh, launch this problem. Uh, project together, and then we bring in relevant research that we can use um, to inform the pathway as well as collect information to help improve the program as we go. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the evaluation we've been doing for the past year and a half. Um, we have been focusing our efforts in four main areas. Uh, that's the teacher's evolution, so their growth in computer science knowledge and then their confidence in teaching, uh, what computer science actually looks like in an elementary and middle school setting, um, because it is relatively new, uh, what students are experiencing and their growth and their confidence, and then the building of the larger district pathway. We have done this by collecting a lot of data. We've done student surveys with the elementary school students and middle school students, teacher surveys pre and post year and after every professional development. We have done many hours of observations of both professional development and what's happening in the classroom. Uh, we've done interviews and focus groups with teachers. We have lots of artifacts, whether it be student work or curriculum. And then we've taken um, many pages of meeting notes that have all informed our evaluation. So we're going to give you a peek at just some high level highlights of all the things we've been learning um, related to um, how CS and VSP is going. So on the screen in front of you, you're going to see the results of a pre and post survey. So let me give you some context. So one important component of making sure that VS, the CS ed and VPS is, is going to go forward is teacher learning. So we often use the words uh, professional development to talk about that. There's lots of things for teachers to learn. There's new curriculum. There's actually CS content knowledge. There are some technologies that can go with it. And then also to the pedagogical strategies of how to teach um, computer science. So there's all kinds of things. This type of professional teacher learning can take a lot of forms. There are like formal workshops and trainings. There's individual coaching that happens. There are conversations that happen with um, other collaborative teachers. And there's something called co-teaching we'll talk about in a minute. So this graph that you'll see um, is um, something that we ask teachers about at the end of year one. So given all of the professional learning experiences they had over the course of year one, which ones were the most helpful? And I'd like to draw your attention to the middle bar, which says integration is co-teaching. So this is a very, um, this model of professional development was very, um, Bloomington really wanted to do this. This was a core component. And um, this basically what this is, is a classroom teacher works alongside a computer science specialist or a tech integrationist. And there are different ways that relationship evolves over the course of the year. But what I'd like you to notice is that this was the most um, influential, helpful form of professional learning that happened over the first year. Um, what else do I want to tell you? I think that's it. Next slide, please, Annie. So another data point across some surveys we gave to teachers, both at the beginning of the program in year one and at the end of the program in year one, we asked them a lot of different things. And one of the things we asked them about was their confidence. 
So this is brand new content, brand new everything. How do you feel about moving into the classroom and doing these things? This chart will just show you the top bar is the beginning of the year and the bottom bar is the end of the year. And you're going to see how teachers' confidence grew over the course of the year. So you'll notice um, at the, um, the post-survey, there are very few teachers that don't feel confident at all compared to the beginning of the year. And in fact, on the, at the end of the year, 25% of the teachers that responded to that survey felt very confident. And we had no teachers that felt that way at the beginning of the year. So um, what can we tell you? Um, again, very high level uh, summary findings here. So one, in year one, the teachers grew in confidence and they grew in their skills about how to teach CS and what CS is. The professional development experiences that Bloomington has provided for teachers have been effective. Um, overall, the majority of teachers found or rated the professional development activities to be excellent or above average. Again, co-teaching was the most effective form of professional development, according to teachers. And we think that Bloomington should consider this model um, and expanding this model to perhaps some other initiatives it has going on. All right, so what does computer science look like in elementary school? And I know a lot of people were worried that computer science with kindergartners, first graders, second graders was gonna put them in front of the screens more, but actually it's quite the contrary. Um, there's robots and manipulatives and learning about computers with through books. And so they're problem solving, they're collaborating, they're presenting. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do to teach computational thinking skills without using a screen. Um, one of the heart and souls of the first year were, was the computer science integrationists. So the people coming in, uh, Whitney Dieterman was one of them co-teaching, really showing that students are capable of learning in this specific way. And this way is very engaging as well, um, both in computer science and beyond. And so it was uh, a, a great experience for both the teachers and the students within this environment. Um, so the top findings just uh, was a, a, by our evaluation pillars, it was a, a successful first year launch of the LNCS immersion. That curriculum was very hands-on engaging, so much so that there is many um, points where kids would cheer when the computer science person would come into the room for the week. Uh, the program addressed the opportunity gaps according to the co-teachers and that they noticed that you didn't have to be a high achieving student to be successful and happy within computer science. Um, and teachers are still curious about what this looks like um, in the future and what it's going to look like when there is no longer a computer science specialist. So what do the students think? Um, these are some quotations from students who participated in that immersion program. And I'll just draw your attention to a word that appears in all three quotes, which is fun. So again, these are um, the voices of students from Poplar Bridge and Indian Mounds. And then, of course, um, we asked them about computer science and what they thought. And we asked them that at the beginning of the year, and we asked them that at the end of the year. And this chart is going to show you some results. So notably, both at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, the most selected descriptive word for computer science in school is, is the word fun, beginning and end. You will notice a very noticeable shift um, from the beginning to the end to students who um, went from thinking it was okay, so that, that grew by leaps and bounds, and noticeably at the beginning and end of the year, um, very few students um, used the word boring to describe uh, computer science in school. So I'll just make a note that this um, finding about fun um, connects back to one of the purposes Bloomington has for computer science, which is joy. High level findings for student experiences. So one, they are growing in their computer science knowledge and their thinking skills. They really enjoy computer science in school. 
And some recommendations for the next years of the initiative is we recommend deepening and extending the curriculum to make stronger connections to the real world and also an increased focus on nurturing students' computing identities. And this connects, connects back to the disparities that Annie was um, telling you about at the beginning of this um, presentation. You just you can't do enough work there. All right, so middle school immersion. These are just initial findings as we're still within uh, year one, but just as a reminder, so the sixth grade at Olson Middle School, there's two cohorts of students that are doing immersion programming, which means two of their exploratory quarters are computer science. And then they have computer science integrated with their full year of social studies and integrated with their health and arts exploratory. And so when we talk about integration, where these are teachers kind of collaborating, finding a middle ground, what does it look like when computer science and a content area comes together? And on the screen is an example of a project that was done in social studies, but used the computational thinking and scratch skills where a student actually coded a timeline of the U.S. Dakota War. Um, and so these are evolving projects, but students are having a lot of fun and finding new ways to express what they know in the classroom. And then Annie's going to play a video here of one student. My favorite part about computer science was the app project because everyone's ideas were completely their own and unique because you thought of something completely different versus some other kid thought of polar bears and how they were going to go extinct soon. So they wanted to do something about that. And you got to see the kind of thought process through the entire thing because you got to go and look at the code. So what I love about this video is she's really expressing that sweet spot that we're hoping to get to where we combine students' interests and passions and then their skills um, with computational thinking and coding in a society that is based on technology to make a difference um, based on things that they care about. And that's where we get that engagement from students. My, my favorite part about computer science was the app project. And then as far as findings, um, initial findings is mainly just that we're seeing a big disparity because there are students who came from the elementary immersion programs and students who came from the non-immersion programs. The students who came from Poplar Bridge to Olson have a much stronger skill set, even with only one year. And that year was partially cut off by COVID. They have stronger coding skills, problem solving skills, computational thinking skills. And so we need to find a way to catch those other sixth graders up when they enter immersion programs. But it's a great thing to see um, such progress. All right, now we're going to present uh, the district pathway. And so um, we just kind of wanted to showcase all of the things that are happening. And this is really quite a short summary, all the different places where computer science is growing within your district. It's growing much faster than the original plan as the online school part is added as well. Um, just want to acknowledge to the little arrows in between shows how students can jump in between immersion programs and CS for all programs, depending on how in depth they want their experience to be. Um, but really, it's been amazing to see how COVID hasn't really slown, slowed much the growth of this district pathway. Um, related to that, uh, we just want to acknowledge that the projects are growing and so being really cognizant that the people who are managing these progress uh, projects, um, ensuring that they don't have too much on their plate because we of course want quality. And then Cassie and I have the opportunity to really see computer science across the state. And Bloomington is getting out ahead of every other school district we know. Um, other states generally, other than Minnesota, are building computer science legislation. And this is coming to Minnesota. Uh, Bloomington's gonna be way ahead of it. And so how can we market more that um, Bloomington has this very unique high quality program for anybody that would be interested in coming to Bloomington Public Schools. Uh, thanks, Lana and Kathy and Annie. Uh, you can see lots of talented people working on this program. Uh, sustainable program development uh, doesn't happen in isolation. It happens through the collaboration of a lot of partners. As you can see, our partnership with the University of Minnesota is, is key. Um, we want to acknowledge that you know, the teams within our district as well play key roles, our instructional friends, our learning sports leaders, 
site and district leadership, and of course, the teachers and students and parents who choose and are actively involved in the program. So thanks to, thanks to the, all those folks. Uh, and thank you board members for hearing the, tonight's update. We have a few minutes if you have any questions for this team. Great, thank you. Thank you, um, Director Weiser, and thanks to your guests for being here tonight. We do appreciate the partnership with the University of Minnesota, and uh, it really makes me want to go back to kindergarten. <laughs> so many opportunities in Bloomington, right? That's pretty cool. Okay, any questions, board members? And uh, maybe we can take the, I don't know if we can take the presentation down so we can I can see everyone <laughs> when they raise their hands. Thank you. And I'll let's go back. Any questions, comments? Okay, we'll go with Director Bennett. Uh, really, no questions. Just a, a big thank you um, to the you know University of Minnesota staff and especially to uh, Executive Director Weiser for the foresight to to push this program a couple years ago. When uh, this first came to us, we never thought that a pandemic would be <laughs> around the corner and, and how uh, important all this stuff would be. So thank you to the district for um, bringing this and, and making providing this great opportunity for our students in our district. Definitely. Any other board members? Who want? We'll go with Juma and then we'll come back to you, Director Beer. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. So she mm -hmm. has her hand up. Sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add on to what Director Bennett was saying, how I think that this is like super beneficial because I know so many people in high school already love AP computer science so much. Um, so like implementing all that in elementary and middle school before is super cool because STEM is the future and uh, I think it's really great for students to learn that early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Director Beebe. Mm -hmm. um, I was encouraged to see how you start out with not working on the screens and developing those patterns and the other computational skills with the students before they get onto the technology. Um, I really appreciate the creative things you're doing. And I think if we give kids something joyful to come to school for, you know, that really helps them have um, highlighting their day. It also um, shows them learning is fun and um, keeps them engaged. And I think that's that's really key to our students, especially coming off of COVID and, and um, the challenges that there have been. So keep up the great work. Um, I'm encouraged to see the progression of this. I'm also encouraged to see that it is being expanded and that we are on the cutting edge. So thank you for your part in what you're doing to make that happen. Director Sorum. Hi, yeah, I just was impressed too, especially with the teacher's confidence levels going up so much. And I think that was one of the big things that we were worried about is the more they are confident and show that confidence, the more the students are excited and getting more confident too. I'm just hoping we have another while. Right, John? I think your technology failed you there, Director Sorum. You cut out for me. Uh, I, I will say this, like we are in the people business and uh, there isn't anything that gets kids more excited than having teachers who are excited and um and so i think it really has translated well like i can't speak highly enough for this team um and the work that they've done the other thing i'll say is you know we we mentioned at most board meetings uh, the pgp comes up as a mention but the heart of the pgp is asking students like what do you want to be when you grow up what how how can we help you be successful and i think computer science is one of those programs that really is a response to that question uh, kids are engaged by technology. We know from all the anecdotal evidence from being around kids, like technology is a big part of their lives. And um, 
giving a way to channel that passion into um, both following into their learning, but also following their lead into like career paths, creative, creative paths um, is super important. And so I see this as like one of those really action components of uh, living our mission and vision in the district. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? No? Okay. Uh, make sure you turn your microphones off again, please. Uh, I, I just have one question. So I, I like how you address the equity aspect of this um and how you talk about um computer science providing opportunities for all right it's it's one way of providing equal opportunities for everyone um what i would like to hear or know a little bit more about and it doesn't have to be today but just something to think about as as we continue to move in this process or, or in this path um you know school school and learning is for all children. It doesn't really mean that all students perform well, right? Um, immersion school for languages, for example, it includes um, students who are speakers. And in the case of a Spanish immersion, you know, you will have Spanish speaking students or native students. That doesn't mean necessarily that they perform better than their peers who are um, English speakers, native speakers. And so in the case and in the situation of um, computer science, where do you see these disparities or inequities being addressed in, 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 in which area, or I don't know, I'm trying to find a way of getting some light of, are we gonna see all of our students being successful? Does it mean everyone is gonna have, is gonna be successful, is gonna have equal opportunities, or are we still gonna see some students being at more, uh, in the more um, situation of advantage than others? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a brief comment and then I think we've got more expertise um, uh, in the other speakers, so I'll let them chime in. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. Like we, we early on in this process, we, um, we really asked each other and asked our teachers, like, what are the important issues in raising kids in the 21st century? And equity is one of those things that rose to the top. This was a tangible way to address some of those equity issues. Um, if a, a system like ours, a large system that plays a big part in so many uh, in, in society, if we take no stance on, on an issue like this about the, you know, com should computer science be steered this way or that way, we get the results that we already have, which is people whose natural interests are in computer science tend to seek out um, ways to fulfill that interest. People with more means have more opportunities um, to seek out their interests. And you, you get this, art, what I feel is an artificial separation of haves and have nots. And so choosing uh, an equity goal as one of our top line goals is a way of saying like, let's show the opportunities to every kid so that we don't have girls giving up on math. We don't have uh, students of color giving up on the sciences because it just doesn't seem like it's for me. Um, when, when, we don't, when we don't take action in that, in that way, those are the, the outcomes that we, we see in society today. So I don't know if Lana or Cassie or Annie have something to add to that. I just wanted to add that um, there was a lot of very intentional curriculum selection. There was a lot of different companies coming at us at the beginning saying, you know, use this curriculum, use this curriculum. We ultimately chose one that was based on research-based practices of how to engage students that aren't traditionally included in the computing um, 
experience. And so that's group work that is connecting them to people who look like them. And that's why we have different computer scientists who come in. Um, it's why we didn't, we started early because um, students are told at a very young age, whether it's directly or indirectly, that this is a space for them or not. And so we wanted them to experience from day one that you can succeed in this space. And so that if they wanted to later in middle school or high school, they could engage in more immersive experiences. Um, and so I really think the curriculum selection and what's happening actually in the elementary classrooms is how we're addressing the equity. And I think I'll just do one other addition to what Lana said. And I think the key is part of this is the elementary um, starting then. Research shows us that it's early, it's late elementary, early middle school when girls in particular lose confidence and lose interest in STEM and computer science. And that confidence has nothing to do with academic ability. It has to do with interest. So Bloom, one of Bloomington's like core values for computer science is joy. And so this is also a very intentional piece, I think, to keep on those equity issues is early and focusing on all students having um, rich experiences because they're all interested in it at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think I, that if I had taken computer sciences when I was a little girl, I could have been the astronaut that I wanted to be. <laughs> hey, but I'm a teacher, so I'm pretty happy with that too. <laughs> and so um, just one more question, um, and I'm, I'm guessing it's, it's yes, but I'm, I'm assuming that you're going to be collecting data to see how students, as they continue to move up in grades, um, it, to see what the impact is in academic performance. I would love to see that, you know, that years along the way that we can see how this computer science um, focus has made that huge impact in not only in their personal lives, but also in their academic lives and to see uh, you know, when it relates to, let's say, uh, different groups of kids, you know, how that played a role in their academics later in their lives it would be interesting to see. So, yeah, well, thank you very much. This is pretty exciting. Really love this initiative and the hard work that um, all of you have put into this. So thank you. And thank, thank you, you for being here tonight. Yeah. Thanks. Well, let's move into our next item in the agenda. Um, we have, I just lost my pen. Okay, so I think we have acceptance of donations. So we have a resolution. Could someone please read that resolution? Director Olson. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 271 accepts donations as indicated in the background in the amount of $20,550.59. Is there a second? Second, BB. Thank you. And here we have with us Mr. Rod Sikovich, Executive Director of Finance and Support Services. Chair Carmen, Superintendent Ujitaki, board members. Uh, this is a normal resolution that we usually do at least uh, once a month uh, to give recognition of uh, individuals that have or companies that have provided to the district donations. Um, included in this donation is monetary donations for uh, Indian Mounds and uh, the Senior Achievement Recognition event. Also, uh, a value in kind donation to Valley View Elementary School. Uh, the actual details of each of these uh, donations will be scrolled at the end of the board meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any questions, comments, board members? Okay. I don't see any, any hands up, so uh, I think we're going to proceed to vote. So all those in favor of approving donations tonight, please say aye. Director Bibi. Aye. Director Bennett. Aye. Director Olson. Aye. Director Sorum. Aye. Director Starks. Aye. 
and form an I, and this has been approved. So thank you very much to all of those who have um, made donations to Bloomington Schools. We appreciate your generosity. Uh, okay, so we're gonna move into fees. Fees 2021-2022, and the first one that we have is the student parking fees. So could someone please read that resolution? Director Starks. Be resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 271 approves student parking fees for Kennedy High School and Jefferson High School at the rate of $270 per year or $90 per trimester for the 2021-2022 school year. Second, BB. Thank you. Superintendent Fujitaki. Thank you. Adam supports this, this resolution that proposes no increases to student parking fees for the coming school year. Thank you. Any comments or questions about this one? I don't think so. So we're ready to vote. So all those in favor of approving the parking fee, please say aye. Um, Director Bini? Aye. Director Bennett? Aye. Director Olson? Aye. Director, Director Sorum? Sorum? Aye. Director Stars? Aye. aye. And Corman, aye. That is six votes. It's been approved. The next one is the student instrument user fees. Someone please read that resolution. Director Olson. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 271 approves student instrument user fees for the 2021-2022 school year. Second. Okay. Thank you. Superintendent. Thank you. Administration also supports this resolution that proposes no increases to the student instrument user fees for the coming school year. Thank you. Questions, comments? Seeing none, we're ready to vote. All those in favor of approving this resolution, please say aye. Director Bibi. Aye. Director Bennett. Aye. Director Olson. Aye. Director Sorum. Aye. Director Starks? Aye. And Corman, aye. This one has been approved too. And now we're going to um, student adult admission fees for activities. Could someone please read the resolution? Director Bennett? Be resolved the School Board of Independent School District 271 approves the student athletic fees for the 2021 2022 school year. Uh, we're we're into the student adult admission fees. Is that the one you just read? No. And then we removed a couple of items. So we go into the student adult admission fees for activities. Okay. Well, it's really annoying as parents when they um, send out. Would you like to turn your microphones off, please? Thank you. Tom, do you want me to read it or did you want to read it? Stanley? Oh, no, I got it. Sorry. I was just going with the old format here. Okay. So be resolved the school board of independent school district 271 approves student adult admission fees for activities for the 2021, 2022 school year. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? Second director Olson. Thank you. Superintendent. As with the previous two resolutions, the administration supports this resolution that proposes no increases for student adult admission fees for activities for the 21-22 school year. Okay. Questions, comments? I don't see any, so we're ready to vote. All those in favor of approving this resolution for admissions, please say aye. Director Bibi? Aye. Director Bennett? Aye. Director Olson? Aye. Director Sorum. Director Sorum. Aye. Director Starks. Aye. And Foreman Aye. And this one has been approved. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I think we now move into the for professional negotiations update. 
This is Mayburns. Okay, uh, Chair Corman, Superintendent, Judith Pauke, and members of the school board, I am going to be sharing a brief update on how negotiations are and what point we are right now. So, hopefully, you can all see that. So, just a brief overview for the 1921 negotiations. All units except paraprofessionals have ratified their contracts, and we've brought those to the board as they've been ratified. All units have settled within board parameters. The paraprofessional unit and the district have met many times, including three rounds of mediation and then several times after the last mediation in June. Um, and we have failed to reach an agreement at this point. Um, both teams have worked hard. I think there's been good discussion at the table. Um, we just don't have an agreement right now. The last session with paraprofessionals was March 18th of this year. So how things look as far as paraprofessional uh, comparisons to base year. So when we cost a contract in the district, the base year is always the last year of the contract as you move forward. So we take information from that base year, which would have been the 1819 contract year for the 1921 contract, and then pull information from other districts' wages and benefits to calculate what the average wage and benefit cost would be in the surrounding districts. And you can kind of see on this slide where Bloomington falls as far as the average wage and benefit cost. We've been at board parameter in all of our offers since mediation. And we've tried numerous ways to try to reallocate that money to try to meet unit needs. So if we thought we heard something, we would try to allocate money, you know, to that area. Um, and we've done that as a unit pointed out a few weeks ago, um, several times. We've tried to come up with different ways to allocate that money. Again, we remain at board parameter and have settled all outstanding monetary items at this time with the paraprofessionals, all that's left uh, to discuss is money. The district's last offer was made on the 18th and the wage schedules are shown here what that offer looked like. Um, so that would be for the 1920 contract year and the 2021 contract year. One thing to note, 96% of paras are on the class three uh, band. So we have most of our pairs in that class three level. If the district offer was accepted, the wage ranges for the 2021 school year for class three pairs would be $15.35 to $21.65 an hour in non-longevity steps. The average wage increase for step movement for class three without any change to the schedule is 6.64% each year through year six. So through Step six, the average increase is 6.64% with no change to schedule. And that encompasses about 34% of the units. I know many times the parents have come forward and have pointed to intermediate 917 uh, to the board and compared wages to them. I, I do need to point out that that is not a comparable uh, district because they are setting uh, for SED program which is something that we don't provide in the district. So it's not a comparable wage. Next step, uh, we did give our last best final offer at the 318 meeting. So we did give, since there's only uh, monetary left and we've reached it, um, we did give our last final at the meeting. The district is currently now asking that the paraprofessional unit please take our final offer to membership to review and to vote so that people can move forward. Um, we've done a lot of discussion um, and we just need to move on to next steps. Any questions? Um. Thank you, Mrs. Burns. Thank you for bringing the update. 
Okay, we're going to move into board member reports now. And uh, before I give you the report on the board superintendent search committee, um, I will let you start. Whoever wants to go first. Director Sorum. Hi, uh, yeah, I, I neglected to provide, or we didn't provide the March 8th meeting. <clears throat> we did have the PTSA mem meeting with all members of all the schools. And um, DDAC, we also had a DDAC meeting with members of all the schools. And it's interesting to note that when we have all these virtual meetings, everybody, everybody shows up and attends. And it's just interesting to share the different uh, pictures and icons and live pictures moving in and out on BEC TV so that you can, you can get a chance to see everybody. And but I'll be involved in two other advisory committee meetings this week too. And a question keeps coming up is when can we meet in person as an advisory committee meeting? And so they wanted to know if does the board authorize when we can meet in person? And then at the same time, has the board considered when we're going to meet in person again? So there's a lot of that floating around in the various um various advisory committees and people want to know when are we going to get back to live meetings? So I'll leave that with the chair. Thank you, Mr. Sorum. Director Olson. I just wanted to bring up that um, the legislative, we went to a legislative advocacy seminar several of us and there are many bills on the floor right now that are related to education and um, so I would encourage the community and the, the school community the stakeholders to look into these bills and see if there's anything that you know they really want to support share a personal story as to why you support it and um, that always works best uh, right now for example um, increasing teachers of color act that is on the Senate floor right now. So that is bill SF446. If that is something that is um, important to you, I suggest contacting your local senators. And you can certainly contact any of us to help you do that if you'd like. All right, thank you. Thank you, Director Olson. Director Beebe. I want to say thank you to the negotiating team um, that I've been working with, with um, Mary Burroughs and Rod Zipkovich and um, uh, Jennifer McIntyre and the incredible amount of time that they have invested in working with the, um, the para unit in the negotiations. Um, appreciate their, how do you say it? They just, they just really know what they're talking about and they have been working very hard and cooperatively and um, I don't think we should take that for granted. So I spent a lot of time with them and I've grown to very much appreciate them and their skills. So thank you very much. Thanks, Director Beebe. Anyone else? My turn. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a lot, so just bear with me. Uh, okay. So about the uh, board superintendent search committee. So as you know, back in March 5th, uh, Superintendent Les Fujitaki announced that he will not be seeking renewal of his contract uh, that is expiring on June 30th, um, 2021. So after that, on March, on the meeting on March 8th, I, if you remember, I appointed a three member board superintendent search committee, and that is um, Director Steiger and Director Bennett and myself. So we started with our meetings on Friday, March 12th, where we met, the committee met with um, Mrs. Deb Bunkle and uh, Mr. David Holman. And then on March 15, we had another meeting 
uh, with the committee, but then we also invited um, members of the cabinet and um, uh, Mr. Kaufman. And on Wednesday, the 17th, we met again, but this time we invited the elementary principals, uh, the secondary principals, and also the union leaders. Uh, then uh, we had another meeting on March 18, um, and once again, uh, the committee met, and uh, uh, Mrs. Bunker was with us. She, she's been with us so, during all those meetings, so we truly appreciate having her <laughs> right there. Um, okay, so um, at that point, then um, the committee concluded that we would be bringing a recommendation to you tonight. And the recommendation is that uh, we attend an MSBA professional development session uh, that will be in um, relation to, um, it's a training on superintendent um, search and that will be specifically um, to Bloomington. So that's, that is our recommendation. Uh, besides that, another recommendation is to, uh, or, or part of the process that we're following here after we have that MSBA training on this topic, then we'll be establishing also a, a special meeting of the school board that follows that training next week on Monday. So I don't know if Director Bennett has anything that he would like to add to this. Um, yeah, you, you did a really good job summarizing. Um, yeah, so we're planning on having the professional development with MSBA. It's um, one I've, I've already gone through with my, my other district, and it'll kind of lay out the different options of processes that we could we can then take. But being that it's a professional development, we can't really have a conversation because all those kind of conversations need to be in public. So that's why we're going to do the professional development on the following Monday, have a, um, a special meeting, so we can kind of together as a board decide which process we want to to take moving forward. So that's kind of why we're doing the two different meetings. I don't know if anyone else has any any other questions that they want to ask uh, myself or the chair. Now would be the time. Director Sorin. So you, so at your subcommittee meetings. <clears throat> you had you met with the secondary principals and and told them things or asked them things and then at the elementary principals the same thing applied and then representatives of the collective bargaining groups also but no yes, no no public, no public input well, we wanted to talk to employees first and kind of get their input. You know, I think um, a lot of people have been here longer than us that have been through you know, different superintendent searches. We wanted to to pick their brains and, and see what kind of advice that they would have for us. We felt that was kind of the first step and then talk to the board to see what the board wants to do. And then at that point, then we, we would um, look at uh, community engagement with our uh, parents or just a school community to find out their uh, their wishes and dreams and hopes and, and all those things. Yeah. Correct. And once again, to clarify, this, this committee um, was formed with the intention of bringing a recommendation to the board or how to start the process, the hiring process. So we're not there yet. It is only when we get to that process, then, then we will be doing more engagement and once again i'm sure you know engagement of our staff but as well of engagement of uh, the rest of our community that obviously includes uh, parents and students yeah. any other questions okay. so we're gonna need here i need to make two different motions so um i would like um you know, I move to establish a professional development session of the school board on Wednesday, March 24th at 4.30 p.m. for MSBA training on the topic of superintendent search process. Second. Thank you. Okay, I think we're good to vote now. All right, so all those in favor of approving this PD session, please say aye, Director Bibi. Aye. 
Director Bennett? Aye. Director Olson? Aye. Director Sorum? Aye. Director Starks? Aye. And Foreman, aye. Okay, so that has been approved. The next one, I move to establish a special meeting of the school board on Monday, March 29 at 7 p.m. to discuss a superintendent search process. Second. Thank you. All right, well, let's move to vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Director Bibi? Aye. Director Bennett? Aye. Director Olson? Aye. Director Sorum? Aye. Aye. Director Starks? Aye. aye. And Foreman, aye. Thank you. And then um, the school board superintendent search committee will be also possibly also be meeting on Saturday, March 27th at 4 p.m. if needed uh, to prepare for the special meeting. Okay, so that is all the report I have tonight. I think I'm gonna move now to superintendent's report. Great, thank you. And I have three congratulations to offer. Congratulations to John Weiser and his team. Our Bloomington Online Schools has been approved by the Minnesota Department of Education as a state approved online learning provider. Congratulations to Isabel Lynch and Molly Arnold, who are the 2021 Athena Award winners from Jefferson and Kennedy High Schools respectively. The Athena Awards are annually given to an outstanding female athlete from each school's senior class. Finally, congratulations to Jefferson High School language arts teacher, Mitt Hupton, who has been selected as one of 25 semifinalists chosen from across the state for the Education Minnesota Teacher of the Year Award. So congratulations to all of these people. Back to you, Chair Corbin. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations to everyone. And thanks again for all the work that you do. Um, Okay, I think we're coming to the end now. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm feeling kind of like empty because usually we have those very long, super long meetings. I'm feeling like I'm missing something, but I don't think so. So I think everything is covered. Any other business? No? Okay. So then I would like to move a German at the meeting. Is there a second? Second, BB. Thank you. Those in favor of adjourning the meeting, please say aye. Director Bibi. Aye. Director Bennett. Aye. Director Olson. Aye. Director Sorum. Aye. Director Starks. Aye. And Foreman Aye. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.